Well, the time has finally come and we get our long-awaited sequel to Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, written and directed by James Gunn. This takes place shortly after the events of the first movie, and we find the Guardians doing their thing, saving the galaxy for fun and profit, and occasionally getting in trouble with the authorities, until one day when Peter's long-lost father suddenly shows up out of nowhere. We learned at the end of the last movie that Peter is only half-human, and now we finally get to meet his alien half. And at long last, Peter Quill gets to spend some quality time with Dad, though that quality time may come at a price. So going into the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie, I wasn't really sure what to expect. It was based on this obscure Marvel property that I really didn't know anything about, and I ended up liking it quite a bit. It was a lot of fun. The sequel, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, is pretty much more of the same, and in this case, that's a very good thing. Pretty much everything you enjoyed from the first movie has returned. The silliness, the big action sequences, the colorful characters sometimes literally, and the awesome soundtrack. There are some neat little Easter eggs, there's a moment where a couple of the characters very briefly visit the Dark World that we saw in the last Thor movie, and we have a few fun cameos, including Howard the Duck once again, and not in the end credit sequence this time, he's just featured in the middle of the movie. And I really get the feeling James Gunn wants to make a Howard the Duck movie. The heroes from the first movie that you know and love are all back, although Groot is now baby Groot and is adorable as hell. Apart from Groot, they're all pretty much exactly as you remember, and the actors slipped back into these roles with no trouble at all. Gamora's sister Nebula, played by Karen Gillan, also returns, as does Yondu, played by Michael Rooker, and his band of Ravagers. And we get a bit more character development for both of them, and go a bit more in-depth with their relationships to Gamora and Peter Quill, aka Star-Lord. And we have a few new characters. We have a very brief appearance from Stakar O'Gord, played by Sylvester Stallone, of all people. And he was apparently Yondu's mentor of sorts until Yondu was exiled from the Ravagers for reasons I won't go into here because spoilers. We have a new Ravager leader who calls himself Taserface, which everyone in the movie finds hilarious. <laughs> I love how this character is constantly trying to be intimidating, but keeps getting undone by his own poor choice of code name. That was wonderful. We have a new alien race who call themselves the Sovereign, and this was an interesting bunch of people. They have golden hair and skin and ridiculously overinflated egos, and their entire battle fleet is powered by remote-controlled drones, and the consoles that they use to pilot these drones make 1980s arcade game sound effects, because why not? And speaking of overinflated egos, we actually have a character in this movie named Ego, Star-Lord's father, played by Kurt Russell, and he is basically a god. Russell was very good in this role, and I thought they did a really good job with this character. He's very self-centered, his name is Ego, but he's also not without heart and does seem to genuinely care for Peter and his late mother, though he doesn't always choose the best way to show it. And we have Ego's empathetic servant, Mantis, who can sense other people's emotions by touching them. And I thought this character was... okay. She did provide a few laughs and has an interesting relationship with Drax, but she also kind of falls into a trap that these types of characters often fall into, which is explaining to the audience exactly what every character is feeling as if we couldn't already tell. And it's usually not a good sign when the character's main purpose seems to be to state the friggin' obvious. That being said, it is kind of appropriate to have a character in this movie that focuses on other people's feelings, because this movie is all about the feelings. Almost every character in this movie is, at one time or another, having a moment with another character. There's a whole lot of moment having. There's Peter and Ego, or Peter and Gamora, or Drax and Mantis, or Yondu and Rocket, oddly enough. There's an unusual amount of sentimentality focused on Yondu in this movie. I certainly was not expecting that at all, but... Oddly enough, it kind of works. They go into a lot of his backstory and how he was basically a father figure of sorts for Peter when his real father was absent, and what caused him to be exiled from the Ravagers, and it all works remarkably well, and Michael Rooker does a great job with the parts. I dare say he might have stolen this movie. The villain in this movie 
turns out to be Ego, which I don't think is a spoiler because the character's name is Ego. Of course, he's going to turn out to be the bad guy. And he is a much better villain than Ronin from the first movie. He's much more intimidating than Ronin for sure and has far more interesting motivations. There's a lot more to him than just wanting to take over the galaxy because he's the bad guy and that's what he does. Of course, there's a fair amount of comedy in this movie, and the comedic moments work very well, especially the stuff with Baby Groot. Do not press the death button. Don't push the death button. Why is there a death button anyway? Seriously, why would Rocket do that? You know there's a high probability that Groot is going to screw this up and kill all of you. Why would you even give him the chance? Why is there an instant death button? The answer, of course, is because shut up. The action sequences were a lot of fun, and the body count was ridiculous. Especially one scene in particular involving Yondu and his arrow. Oh lord, that's... that arrow is lethal. And the soundtrack adds so much to this movie. Of course, Peter has a personal connection to it, since it's all based on music his mother liked. And there's a really nice moment between him and Ego when they're discussing the song Brandy, You're a Fine Girl and how it relates to the two of them. They also made some very interesting choices regarding the soundtrack and the action sequences, and the tone of the songs is often in sharp contrast to what's actually going on on the screen. By design, I'm sure. The opening action sequence features the Guardians fighting this huge, tentacled space monster, and the whole time they're fighting this monster, Baby Groot is dancing to Electric Light Orchestra's Mr. Blue Sky, a very happy and upbeat song while there are all these explosions going on in the background and bodies flying left and right, and it just, it does not fit at all. And yet, it works. Overall, this was another entertaining adventure in space with this ragtag group of heroes, and I can definitely recommend it. I think I like it a little bit more than the first movie, mainly because the characters have a bit more depth this time around, and we have a much better villain. If you haven't seen the first movie, I don't know that you necessarily need to see it before you see Volume 2. I think you should see it at some point because it's awesome, but you can go into Volume 2 completely fresh and still enjoy it. And like all Marvel movies, there's a lot of stuff going on during the credits and after the credits, so make sure you stay all the way to the end. And that's about all I can say about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. If you haven't already, go see it. Until next time, take care.